Amen. And as you're taking your seat, let's take out our Bibles this morning and open them to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, For those of you that are visiting or for those that came to the stage earlier and we were out of notes, we were able to print some more. Uh, So you guys are welcome to come up at this time and get a copy of the sermon notes if you would like to follow along. Otherwise, you can find them on our website and inside the YouVersion Bible app if you use that app uh, for the Bible. But we're, we're in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, talking about the story of Moses. And just to, to reintroduce the passage as we do every week, uh, it is very important for us to understand the intentions of the writer. Uh, there's uh, some questions that we need to ask as Christ followers, as readers, as disciples of the Word, every time we read from the Word. And that is, uh, who wrote it? who they wrote it to, and what were they dealing with at the time in which they wrote it. If you can get the answer to those questions, you will be less likely to pull something out of context. And so very important when studying the Scriptures uh, and and looking at what was going on during their time. And so what the writer of Hebrews was dealing with is a congregation of Jews, many of which likely did not believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They were still practicing the sacrificial system. They were still uh, maybe using more of the work side of religion to gain favor with God than the faith side of religion. And so the writer of Hebrews is pointing out all of the evidence of why we should trust in Jesus Christ alone. And when you get to Hebrews chapter 11, he shows that the only way to God is through faith in Christ. And we believe that, uh, but what he's presenting here is that's not a new idea. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's look at at Abel. Let's look at Enoch. Let's look at Noah. Let's look at Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. And the list goes on in Hebrews chapter 11 of all of these people came to God by faith. And so it presents the message to us today that we too must come to God by faith. I had to make a confession to the 8 o'clock crowd. I had a rough start this morning. It's football season, and so my vocal cords are getting used a lot more before Sunday gets here. Uh, I got three boys playing football this year, and I yell for every one of them. Uh, So just excited about this time of year, but it makes preaching a little bit more difficult. Uh, So we're we're in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. I want to invite you, if you are able, let's stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. We're going to read the whole account of Moses in the book of Hebrews. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of, of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Father, as we prayed last week, we ask again, impact our faith by the example of Moses' faith. May our faith affect our decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about Moses' example that his faith affected his decisions. We agree that, that our faith should affect our decisions. It should affect where we find our identity. It, affect, it should affect our goals and the decisions that we make for God's glory. We also looked at the fact that The single event in time that the writer of Hebrews is highlighting in Hebrews chapter 11 is when Moses saw that an Egyptian was abusing a Hebrew and it was an identifying moment for him. Am I going to identify myself with one of God's people, the Hebrew, the oppressed, or with the worldly Egyptians who are doing the oppressing? And it says in Exodus chapter 2, 
what happens. It says in verse 11, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now the reason why the writer of Hebrews is referencing this particular event It was because this decision is what drew the line and said, I am no longer after this point going to be identified as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I'm now a fugitive. I have united myself with the Hebrews. And it was this decision that then led to him having to flee Egypt, fearing from or fleeing from Pharaoh's wrath to go to Midian is where he wound up and and started a family there and spent 40 more years there. Uh, Acts 7 tells us that he was 40 at the time of this event in Exodus chapter 2. And so when he made the decision, he forfeited all of the power and the prestige that Egypt had to offer him as a member of Pharaoh's household. Uh, The decision essentially that was set before him that we discussed last week uh, was one of identity. Was he going to continue to be identified with the riches of Egypt Or was he going to humble himself and identify with the oppression of the Hebrews, with God's people? And and really, that's a decision that all of our faiths have to make. Uh, Faith has to make the decision, am I going to be identified by this world, or am I going to stand out and be identified by Christ? Am I going to be identified as one of God's children? A man's logic says that the treasures in Egypt are more valuable. Why? Because man's logic looks at the temporary. God's logic spiritually says that the approach of, or the reproach of Christ is of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Why? Because the focus of faith is eternity. Focus of man's logic, temporary. Focus of faith, eternal. There's a, a perfect passage in the New Testament that fits what we're talking about here, and it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And if we could gain this mindset when we're going through suffering, we could really exalt the name of Christ while the suffering is still present. That's what I hope is gleaned from today's message. We do not have to have an answer to our prayer or knowing how a situation is going to turn out in order to magnify the name of Christ in the midst of suffering. So it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. That's exactly what Moses did. He looked at the eternal. He looked at the reward, and he saw that that far outweighed in value anything that he was experiencing in the flesh. Where we ended last week was with saying that where your focus is, there your treasure will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And quoted Matthew 6, 21, Jesus saying, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And so we understand if we focus on the temporary, then our confidence is going to be on the temporary. But if we focus on the eternal, our confidence will be in God. We read from Isaiah 40 at the beginning of the service that says, when I am weary, he is not. When I am weak, he is strong. And I'm able to rely on that strength and and tap into a, a source that's not of this world if that's where my focus is. And I can magnify Christ. So here's where I want to kind of pick up this week. I had so much about these three verses that I didn't want to try to give it to you all in one sermon. We we broke it into two and kind of dealing with the same topic of faith that affects our decisions. But here's something I want you to see this morning, uh, very specific. If If there were a theme to this morning's message, it would be this statement. And that is that when you surrender your present loss to the Lord... Now, let me qualify that. Whenever you experience suffering, and and here's what I don't want you to do. Uh, This room is full of people who are experiencing varying degrees of suffering right now. Uh, I think we all would testify the way that we had planned it, right? They're not going the way that if I were God, that, that I would have them go. 
Uh, they, our plans get messed up, things get changed, people are suffering, people are dying, people are, are getting sick. Learned this morning while I'm sitting in the early service uh, that someone who had gotten out of the hospital is now having to go back to the hospital and, and just lifting them up in prayer with, with breathing struggles. And so all this suffering, what I don't want you to do this morning while we're talking about how to magnify Christ in suffering, don't diminish your own suffering by saying there's someone else suffering more than me. Let me tell you what that'll do. I, I understand the intentions of doing that. We try not to complain. We try not to be woe is me. And so we say there's people much worse off than I am. But if you do that, you will miss the opportunity to glorify Christ in your own suffering. All right, so call it what it is. And if you will turn that loss or that suffering over to the Lord, you will then be able to magnify him in the midst of it. What comes from turning a loss over to the Lord? And, and what's, the, what's the opposite of turning the loss over to the Lord? It's simply focusing on yourself. So someone who focuses on their self in the midst of suffering is, is saying, woe is me, and focusing on all the things that the suffering has caused. A person who turns that loss over to the Lord is asking this question. What is God doing with this, and how can I magnify him through it? They're not waiting for it to be over. God, you let this happen, or you sent this, however it is that... What do you want to accomplish in it? How are you sanctifying my soul? How are you building my character? How can I magnify Christ in the midst of this? If you will do that, here's what you will receive. You will receive a spiritual peace in the present, and you will receive an infinite reward in the future. Moses received both of those. You will receive a spiritual peace in the present, Philippians 4, that if you make supplications, if instead of anxiety, if you will turn things over to the Lord, he'll give you what? A peace that passes understanding that'll guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And then there's the reward that Moses was focusing on. Moses' decision may have forfeited honor from man, but it gained honor from the Lord. And listen to this. I read this from one scholar. Uh, I love this quote. It says, Whatever Moses' social position, if he had remained on as a member of Egyptian society, all we would know of him now was the name on a mummy in a British museum. But instead, we find his name in the hall of God's own beloved heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith affects our decisions, amen? So what causes a man to make a decision like this? The writer of Hebrews says it was faith. All right, so I want to I answer this question a couple of different ways. What causes a man to make a decision like this? Some might say it was blood, right? Blood relative. Uh, you know the statement, blood is thicker than water. Let me tell you, blood is not thick enough to go from a prince to a slave. It wasn't because he had Hebrew in his veins. All right? Uh, some might even say it was an irrational decision. Who in their right mind would give up what Moses gave up in order to bear the reproach and the punishment and the persecution and the oppression of God's people? But we know that's not true either because 40 more years passed after this decision was made and there's no sign of regret for making it. There's no relenting or, or wishing he had done otherwise. And so in order to answer the question of what causes a man to make a decision like this, we have to answer the question of what was his faith in. Faith causes him to make a decision like this. What was his faith in? What did Moses believe that drove him to make these decisions? He believed that the enslaved Israelites were God's people. He believed that the wealthy, powerful Egyptians were living in opposition to God and their pleasures were sinful. Moses knew that it would be far more profitable to be one of God's children in a state of affliction than to be part of the world in a state of fleshly pleasure. And so, so here's, a, here's a place, kind of an emotional place that we have to get to in order to turn our suffering and our loss over to the Lord. We have to get to a place where we value holiness more than happiness, don't we? We have to get to a place where we value God's glory more than temporary satisfaction. Because in my estimation, and, and you might disagree with me, that's okay, you have a right to be wrong, but we have, I'm, 
I've always wanted to use that quote, and I finally got to. All right, so in, in my estimation, this is where I think we measure suffering, okay? We measure it in its temporary effects, don't we? We measure the degree of suffering by the feelings that it is creating in the moment. What has it taken from me? What has it caused in my life? The pain that I'm receiving, the, the loss and the emotion and the mourning and the grief and the list goes on, but, but it's all in the moment. I'm, I'm measuring the depth of the suffering by what I am feeling at the moment. That's why we've been talking so much about the faith mindset looks at eternity, whereas the human mind looks at the temporary. If we can break out of that and say, God's glory is more important to me than my temporary satisfaction. Guess what that leaves you saying? That leaves you saying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whatever your plan has in it, I just want to be a part of it for your glory. Does God's glory mean more to us than our own comfort? Where does this kind of faith come from? A faith in the confidence of God, a faith in the the people of God, a faith in the value of being one of God's children. Where did this faith come from in Moses' life? We've, we've hit on this about three different times over the last four weeks that initially, if you look at verse 23, it came from his parents, right? I love talking about this because parenting is a, a vital role in, in instilling the values of the faith in our children. And in verse 23, it says that, that his parents did not fear the wrath of the king. And so they invested in Moses with every opportunity they had to raise him in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, to teach him the things of God. Verse 27 then says the same thing about Moses that it said about his parents, that he did not fear the wrath of the king. Why? Because it was modeled for him. I tell you, the way that faith is passed from parents down to children is when words and actions match. It's when faith is lived out. Uh, children are either turned away by the hypocrisy of their parents' inconsistencies or they are drawn closer by the consistency of word and deed where we practice what we preach. Now, of course, we're not going to do things perfectly. Uh, I tell you, there's probably been more taught in my household through my mistakes than through what I did right. Why? Because we try to, my wife and I try to be quick to ask for forgiveness and repent of those. Raise your hand if you've ever apologized to your children. There's so much rich lesson in that. The humility, the selflessness, the exalting of Christ that is found in the willingness to say, I am sorry that I yelled at you. I'm sorry that I uh, disciplined incorrectly, or I'm sorry that I presented this inconsistency to you as you're trying to model your life after mine. Please forgive me for that. And repent of it. Teach them about forgiveness and repentance. And I also know that, that being consistent in parenting does not guarantee the salvation of your children, but it certainly encourages it. The greatest thing that a parent can give their child is visible faith. The greatest gift I can give my children is letting them see with their eyes the consistency of their dad's faith living it out in front of them because, as, as we've said before, they make excellent mimics regardless of the instruction they receive. So Moses' faith came from his parents, but I want to tell you something that's often missed in the story of Moses. His faith also came from a divine calling. Moses knew that he had been called by God. His parents knew that he had been called by God. That's the meaning of the Hebrew boy was born, his parents looked upon him and saw that he was beautiful, that didn't mean they just thought he was a pretty kid. That meant that he had a touch from God on his life, is what that word in the, in the Greek means. But he also knew he had a call of God on his life. In Acts 7, verse 25, it says, he supposed that his brethren, brethren would have understood that God would deliver him by his hand, but they did not understand. So Moses, when he went to speak and unite himself with the Hebrews, he expected them to know what he already knew. He already knew that God had placed a calling on his life to be the deliverer of the Hebrew people out of Egyptian captivity. 
And he couldn't help but respond to that call. So where does faith like this come from? How does a guy make these kind of decisions? It's because he recognized the calling that God had on his life. And these callings demand response. I talk to people often that, that have been running from a calling for, for many years. Just had a conversation about two weeks ago about that. So I wonder, uh, just in, in a room this size... Is there anybody in this room that, that has a calling of God on your life to do something with a spiritual gift that God has given you, and you're avoiding that calling? And maybe that's where some of the lack of joy or lack of focus is coming from. Because when, when a calling is recognized the way Moses recognizes it, it demands a response. It demands obedience. And get this, a lot of times that obedience does not make sense give you three examples out of Hebrews 11. Hey, Noah, build a boat. What for? It's never rained. There's going to be a flood. What's a flood? Right? The calling upon a man's life from God, a recognition of that calling, causing you to make a decision that doesn't make sense. Hey, Abraham, sacrifice the, the son of promise that I gave you. You don't hear but he's the son that you made the promise through. No, you hear it, yes, sir. Hey, Abraham, you've got the wood and you've got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? God will provide. The decision often doesn't make sense. How about Moses in Egypt? I'm gonna give up the riches that I have all around me to unite myself with God's people. It doesn't always make sense. You may be led to make some pretty radical decisions to follow the Lord. You have to decide, is his glory more important than your comfort? If you truly keep your heart focused on God's glory, you will consistently be med led to make the decisions that God is calling you to make. Because he desires his glory above all else. Moses weighed his options to be united with Pharaoh or to be united with the one true God. And when you truly set your mind, Colossians 3, when you truly set your mind on the things above and not on the things of this world, you will make decisions contrary to this world's prior priorities. Think, think about this. How often have we used the blessings of God as an excuse to obey the calling of God? because we're not willing to part with those. What, what did Job say? He gave them to me. Is he not capable of taking them away? And whether he's given them or whether he's taken them, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what Moses is saying here. Moses' faith calculated that the reward of heaven was far more valuable than the riches of Egypt. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. The, the end result is good. And so I shall endure and keep my eyes focused on him. Something that I pondered as I was looking at Moses' example is how tight of a grip do I have on my earthly possessions? I want you to think about that for a moment. And that would be measured in your reaction when those earthly possessions are taken from you. Is that grip tight enough that you find your identity in those things? Because if you do, it's going to be catastrophic when those things are no longer yours. And remember what I said, we measure the depth of suffering by the pain in the moment. That pain is often a result of us not wanting to loosen our grip on something that belonged to the Lord anyway, regardless of what that is. Many people try to find a compromise by seeing how much of this world they can still hold on to while they try to follow Christ instead of saying, I'm willing to forsake this world in order to follow Christ. No price too steep, which is forsaking Worldly pleasures and embracing the cross, which is what Christ commands us to do. Now, the ultimate answer to the question that we've kind of been asking over and over with today of, of what causes a person to make a decision like this comes in verse 26. 
So I want you to look at verse 25 and 26 of Hebrews 11. Uh, It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the the passing pleasures of sin. But look at verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So I don't know about you, but that raises a question in my mind. How did a man put faith in someone who would not come until centuries later? But then if you think about it, this is an incredible point for the writer of Hebrews to make because these legalistic Jews that were relying on the works of the religion were really patterning themselves as they thought after Moses, the giver of the law. If anybody were to be a legalist, surely it would be him. We were given the law through him, and we've named the law after him, the Mosaic law. But yet the writer of Hebrews says, even he had faith in Jesus. We know this from other uh, parts of Scripture in the New Testament when Uh, Nathaniel was introducing his brother Philip to Jesus. What does he say in John 1? This is the one that Moses talked about. This is the one that Moses and the prophets pointed to. Or what, what does Jesus say of himself in John 5? If you believed Moses, then you would believe me. Why? Because Moses wrote about me. Moses believed in Jesus. How about Luke 9, the Mount of Transfiguration? Who was on top of that mountain testifying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Moses and Elijah. So we understand with with multiple evidence that Moses had faith in one who would come thousands of years later as his Savior and Lord to bring him a reward that was far greater than anything Egypt had to offer him. Moses knew that there were greater blessings through the sufferings of Christ than there were through the pleasures of man, a lesson that we would do well to learn. Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Jesus says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And Moses agreed with the Apostle Paul, and we would do well to agree with the both of them as well, that anything that I've been able to achieve on this earth, whether it's an education, a title, a job position, a skill, an athleticism, whatever it might be, that these things do not gain me a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, what Moses and Paul would tell you is that they actually get in the way because they promote self-sufficiency, right? Instead of Christ's dependence. Now, those things can be used when they are surrendered to the Lord to say, I want you to get the glory for the talents that you have given me. He wants those talents, but they are not what brings salvation. And so Moses, you you could read the words of Paul in Philippians 3.8 and not change a single word if you were to view them as being from Moses. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. What was more important to Moses than the riches of Egypt? The glory of God. The riches of Christ, the reward of heaven was more important to him. And there was no loss too great that would even compare. He kept his eyes on the greater reward. So in closing, I wanna pose a question for us to ponder as we leave this place this morning. Uh, Going back to the, the varying degrees of suffering that we're all experiencing, or some of us may just wanna call them inconveniences, whatever, however you wanna refer to them, things we don't enjoy. How can I exalt Christ while those things are going on. Not after I see how it's going to work out. 
Not after I see what God's going to do it. How can I set my mind on Christ and the things above and ask myself and find the answer while I'm in it? How can I exalt Christ? How is he sanctifying me? How is he going to use this for his glory? And let me tell you something. He'll show you if you'll just surrender that suffering over to him. He'll show you what he's doing because he's present. Moses knew that this one who was to come was worth forsaking all for. So what's our excuse? He's already come. We have a lot more information about him available to us than Moses had. Do we believe that he's worth it? Do we desire holiness more than happiness? And do we uh, value God's glory more than temporary satisfaction? That's what's going to get us through seasons of suffering with our head held high, weary but trusting on the one who never grows weary, weak but trusting on the one with endless strength to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for example after example after example of enduring faith. You didn't set us on this journey to chart a course blindly. You put such a great a cloud of witnesses around us to show us the way. Moses being one of them with with the faith decisions that he made, with his eyes set on the reward of eternal life in heaven in Christ Jesus. For those of us who have a personal relationship with Jesus, I pray that we will be reminded of the infinite value of Christ, that we will be reminded that your glory is more valuable than, than our satisfaction in the moment and that whatever loss we experience on this earth, may it be for your glory. May it be for the outworking of your plan, which is good and it works out for our good. So may we trust you and make the faith decisions even when they don't make sense. Lord, thank you for the examples that you have given to us, not only in Scripture, but also around us in this church family and, and in our own families and lives, the testimonies of people who have surrendered their lives to you and seek your glory in all things. I pray, Lord, for the lost people that are exposed to our perspective, that they will see that and glorify you through surrendering their lives to you and to your son, Jesus Christ as we just saw testimony this morning of two young children who have done that. What a beautiful celebration that is. We trust you, Lord. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.